Well, if I follow Holmes's instructions, then to begin my investigation into this leather apron, I must first head to the police station. Good evening, sir. What do you... I know you. You were here last week with Sherlock Holmes. Indeed. I have come to bring a message from Sherlock Holmes for Inspector Aberline. Very well. I will pass it on. But come to think of it, someone was asking about you recently. Finley, the caretaker of some shady boarding house nearby. Does that mean anything to you? Ah, perhaps. Actually, I read in the Star that you have arrested a suspect called Leather Apron. You shouldn't believe what you read in that rag, sir. The man is being hunted, but we have yet to get our hands on him, and we aren't close to it either. Why ever not? Bah, he's a specialist in the streetwalker racket. These girls make pitiful witnesses, and we don't inspire confidence. Furthermore, the man seems to be pretty discreet lately. Someone must be helping to hide him. How to get on his trail, then? One of these girls would have to confide in us and give a valid description of the man. Then we'd ask around the journeymen, who use aprons, I imagine. Well, goodbye. I must go to Finley's boarding house. I must go to Finley's boarding house. Good evening, Finley. Oh, good evening, sir. Aren't you the gentleman who was with the great detective the other time? That is indeed me, Dr. Watson. Tell me, Finley, I was told that you were looking for us at the police station. Indeed, I wanted to thank you for last time, you know. That vagrant has never set foot round mine again. I even found a tenant, one who pays his rent, I mean. You don't seem very happy. But you were lucky to have found a good tenant so quickly. It's just that this man is very strange. He paid several days in advance and I gave him a key to the place. Since then he goes out every night and returns at ungodly hours. I'm sure he goes to visit the ladies, but still, every night. And when he moved in, Something must have broken in his case and stank up the stairs in his room for two days. I think it was a jar. It must be over there. Tell me, have you heard talk of Leather Apron? By the papers, that's all. This man seems very sinister. Do you know any journeymen who use this type of apron? The slaughterhouse butchers, I believe, but definitely the cobblers. I know one, old Isaac Solomonovich. His workshop is on a small street in the Jewish community, across from the hospital. He's a good man. He can help you. But you know, the people there are very close and don't share much with non-Jews. Thank you, Finley. At your service, sir. Hmm, this odour is very strong indeed, but the whole neighbourhood as such has a dreadful stench. Finley might have an idea as to what this jar that contained. What do you want, Doctor? You're right, the pieces of the jar that your tenant broke do give off a strange smell. It's true. That's quite normal given his trade. Yes, and what would the trade be of? Your strange tenant. A doctor, like yourself, I believe. Dr. Tumblety, a foreigner. Canadian, perhaps. Dr. Tumblety. It might be interesting to know more about him. Thank you, Finley. At your service, sir. I have no reason to go that way.
A cobbler shop. Hmm. Closed. I will return later. The policeman said the street girls would know something about the leather apron. Maybe I should go and see Lucy. Oh, it's you. I'm coming. Dr. Watson. How are you? Well, and yourself? And how's your uncle? Oh, he sleeps a lot, but he doesn't seem to be suffering. Your medicine has worked wonders. Thank you again. It was the least I could do. I have come to see you about a certain leather apron. Have you heard of him? Oh, yes, of course. Terrible things are said about that man. Have you ever come across him? Goodness gracious, no. But I know that he has threatened and taken many girls in uh, my situation. I don't know what more I can say, but um, Bella would be able to tell you some. Who is Bella? Bella Pullman. She's the landlady of the place where I... Uh, I could take you there if you like. Please do. It's me. It's Lucy. This gentleman would like to speak to Bella. It's the doctor who helped me. I must leave to return to my uncle. Thanks again. Out of the way. I don't like the look of you. If you'd be patient, Madame Bella will arrive in a moment. <laughs> Good evening, I am Dr. Watson. It is young Lucy who told me to come see you. Ah, so you're the Good Samaritan who saved her uncle without asking for anything in return. And now you've come to see me, no doubt, to explain that the poor little thing doesn't belong here and you will see to her future. Well, if you expect me to let her leave with you, <laughs> it's not that, ma'am. Uh, you should know I am a married man. And why should that matter? I believe there has been a misunderstanding. The reason that Lucy sent me here is that you may be able to give me some information about Leather Apron. Are you a doctor or a constable? I am most certainly a doctor, but I am acting in this matter in a private capacity, and I would like to find this man. Well, if you're able to rid us of him, I'll give you a week's worth of free passes. That man is a thorn in our sides. He spies on the girls in the streets and watches them inside the houses, spying through the windows. And as soon as they're finished with a client, he jumps on them without any warning and forces them to give him their money. I've never seen him, but one of my girls was attacked by this man and she said that he wore a leather apron and carried a knife. And his face. Oh, he has a horrible head with rat's eyes and a deformed mouth. She even said that she knew his name, um, Pizer or Pizer, I think. But I don't know where she can be found. Margie Nutcracker, the girl I'm talking about, could tell you more, but I had to let her go last week. Why did you let Margie go? The poor girl caught a shameful sickness, and the symptoms have attacked her face, if you know what I mean. So I gave her notice, and a little bit to help her along. I don't know where she is now, but she'll certainly be getting treatment at the clinic if she's still in the neighbourhood. Did you speak to the police? <sighs> what would they do? Who cares about the girls in the streets? Would you have received a visit from another doctor, a stranger by the name of Tumblety? I'm just like you, Doctor. Sworn to secrecy in my profession. 
But as I've taken a fancy to you, I can tell you that this name is not unknown to me. And if you do me a little favour, it is possible I might remember something about him. Ahem. <clears throat> uh, what kind of favour must I do for you? You see that man over there? He's a rich artist, a painter, a regular client round here. Well, yesterday, he came and left his cane in the umbrella stand in the hall before going into one of the rooms. Well, when he returned to this room, the cane had disappeared. It's a cane with a massive silver knob. It must be worth a fortune. He threatened to call the police unless he got free services in my establishment for a year. And be forced to accept, unwillingly, of course, given the services that he's demanding, unless the cane is found. Did you question the residents regarding the theft? They didn't see anything, and there's not one of them that would risk stealing from a client here. Who was in the room when your weasel of a client was in the chambers? There were a few that came and went, but Mary could tell you better than I can, because she was the one at the counter yesterday. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. No problem, my angel. Can I get a refill, please? <laughs> what happened to this rug? Oh, it was when we got a cold yesterday. I asked the young man to fill the pail. Came back to put it down, but his feet were covered in soot and he made a black print. Madame Bella said it was my fault and I got a shilling's penalty. I also have to clean the print and it's no picnic. He has immense feet, that boy. I heard that there was a theft yesterday. Did you see anything? No, and I was here the whole time. Who delivers the coal? It's never the same person. I've never seen that lad before. Do you always keep an eye on the coat stand? Oh, yes. Well, when the coal delivery came, a client came out of the chambers and stopped me from seeing the boy who brought the bucket of coal. You don't think he would have taken advantage? Until next time, miss. With pleasure, sir. <laughs> a large black footprint. Best not to stray off in that direction. Can I get a please? Best not to stray off in that direction. Good evening, sir. Good evening, my dear ma'am. I was led to believe that you're a doctor. None of the residents of this establishment are among my patients, sir. Oh, you're not here as a doctor, but as a man, then. I understand. This is my kind of place, too. It's in these houses in Whitechapel that you find the girls that are the most natural and definitely the most docile. Your way of speaking about these women is not that of a gentleman, sir. I heard that you were the victim of a robbery here. Oh, I'm not complaining. The loss of that walking stick will certainly bring me a very pleasant compensation. What does your cane look like? The stick is ebony, about 35 inches long. The round knob is made from chiselled silver with a ring around the middle of the same workmanship, just like the tip for that matter. If you find it, don't tell a soul. Keep it for yourself, got it? Well, goodbye, sir. Goodbye, or until next time. And good evening. <laughs> And the night is cool. What a horrible summer we have had. Does the name Tumblety mean anything to you? Not at all. But if you like, I can make inquiries. Fine. Why not? 
One never knows. Well, goodbye. This police station is like a laundry. What a scandal. These footprints are the same as those found on the rug at the brothel. Good evening, Doctor. My name is Dr. Watson. Pleased to meet you. Good evening. I am Dr. Gibbons. Likewise. I have come to see you about one of your patients. Margie uh, goes by the nickname Nutcracker, who gets her prescription from the clinic. She's a lady of the night and is afflicted with a venereal disease. I know who you're talking about. Indeed, Margie has syphilis and is being treated with mercury. Do you have her address? No. And for your information, she left London for good three days ago. She felt threatened. Margie felt threatened? But by whom? I believe that Margie was particularly scared of a terrifying man who attacked her once. Did she say the name Pisa or Pytha? Unfortunately, she didn't give a name, but she described a man with shifty, rat-like eyes and a mouth twisted in a sinister grimace. Did Margie have any idea where this man who terrified her so much might be found? No, but she told me that another girl who'd been attacked like her had told her that this man worked in a cobbler's run by an old Israeli. Also, she saw him again last week the night of the big fire. She told of going to see the fire like most everyone else in the area. While there, she recognised her attacker in the crowds gathered at the warehouses. There was no mistake in a face like that, she said. She kept an eye on the man the whole time the firemen were working in order to avoid him. Pardon me, Doctor, but who made the large black footprints there, near the beds? The brother of one of my patients. The poor thing had a leg amputated after colliding with a carriage. We arranged to find her a prosthesis. Prostheses are very expensive. How did this man pay? He told me that one of his uncles gave him a walking stick with a chiselled silver knob. I agreed to accept this knob in exchange for a simple prosthesis with harness. But this object is of great value and I could finance half a dozen other prostheses by selling it on Petticoat Lane. Doctor, I have reason to believe that the silver knob that you possess is from a cane that was stolen by the man who brought it to you. And I believe I know to whom it belongs. That's what I was worried about. The story of the uncle seemed a little strange. Nevertheless, you must have proof of what you claim. I will show you all of the knobs that we have here. If you find the knob that the young man gave me, I will believe you. So be it, but something is bothering me. I will need a complete cane, not just a knob. Don't worry, dear chap, build one. I can loan you some tools. Make use of the odds and ends in my cupboard. It'll help get rid of it. Hmm, well, I shall try. I will have to remember the description that Sickert gave. Goodbye, Dr Gibbons. Until we meet again, my dear colleague.
There, all done. Holmes couldn't have done better himself. What can I do for you, my dear colleague? I believe I found the knob from the stolen cane, which I succeeded in putting back together. That's the one. And yet I cannot give it to you, Doctor. I will only return it to the police, and only if there is an official complaint against me. Would there be a way to convince you to give me the cane? Find me a dozen solid, adjustable harnesses for wooden leg prostheses, and it's yours, Doctor. Goodbye, Dr Gibbons. Until we meet again, my dear colleague. This interview with the Doctor revealed an important fact. Leather Apron could not be the Bucks Row murderer. According to Margie, the villain passed most of the night of the crime at the fire. He could not have been at the scene of the murder at the moment it was committed. He is nonetheless a dangerous character. Nobody here. How very odd. I say, these things look like harnesses. Oh my, they are noisy. Good evening, sir. Pardon the interruption. The door was open. I didn't think that I would find anyone working at this hour. Good evening, sir. I didn't hear you come in. Say, those things that made noise, they are really harnesses, aren't they? Yes. Horse harnesses. But I must tell you, sir, that the store is normally closed at this hour. That is why I've asked you to return tomorrow. I didn't come about my shoes. I came to speak of a cobbler, perhaps one of your former employees, a man with very particular habits. You aren't with the police by any chance. I'm sorry, but I do not want to speak of anything but shoes with you. I am not a policeman. I am Dr. Watson. It's Mr. Finley who told me that you might be in a position to inform me. Ah, that Mr. Finley is a very brave man. And if he sent you, then you must certainly be a worthy man also. So, Doctor, who is this cobbler of its strange habits? The man of whom I speak is called Pizer or Pyther, a man with a frightening face. Do you know him? Yes, John Pizer. He worked here for a while, but he is no longer here. Do you know where I can find him? No, and if you look, you will not find him. Why? Because he is in hiding, Doctor. You see, a week ago, a horrible murder took place in the neighborhood. A rumor circulated that he might have been responsible for this crime. They say he has quarreled with women of certain virtue in the past, if you understand me. Isaac, it is about the Bucks Road case that I have come to see you. I have the certitude and an incontestable witness that Pizer is innocent, at least of this crime although he has attacked a number of street women. If he doesn't come forward to explain himself to the authorities, he is condemned to hiding and to take the fall for this murder. Furthermore, it will cast suspicions on your community because they must be hiding him. And while the whole police force is hunting for him, they cannot concentrate on the real assassin who roams the streets and, one never knows, may take any one of you any day. If what you say is true, your visit is a God sent to our community, Doctor. I tell you something. I know Sergeant Thick, an honest policeman who lives in the area. I'll tell John's family that he must go there to explain himself. But if you could please go as soon as, soon as possible, possible to the police, police to give them, them this report, report you say it's it incontestable. I will go as soon as I take leave of you. Thank you. If I can ever be of service in any way, do not hesitate to ask. Could we transform your horse harnesses into harnesses for wooden legs? Adjustable harnesses. 
A good craftsman can do anything, Doctor. And I do believe that's what I am. Come back in a while and it will be done. That will be my thanks for what you have done. I shall return later. At your convenience, sir. Ah, I am spent. I would like to return home. But I promised to go to the police as soon as I could. Now then, let's go to the police station. Hey, Doctor. You seem tired. Were you wandering the darker parts of Whitechapel all night? You could say that. I have some information on Leather Apron, the man of whom we spoke earlier. Do you know where he is? No, but I can clear him of the Bucks Row crime. A witness proved him totally innocent. Oh, Watson, Watson, is it only now, after many hours of walking, that you decide to pass on the important message that Inspector Abilene is waiting for? But, um, no. But what are you doing here, Holmes? I was worried, Watson, and with good reason it would appear. Go give the message to this policeman and let's go home. Nobody appreciates me hanging around here, you know, and it's freezing cold. Ah, Cradle, none too soon. You will take the testimony of this... No, you continue with your duty shift. I must find Chowder in Ambry Street. He's struck again. Who? The murderer. The Bucks Row assassin. Hanbury Street. Let's go, Watson. We have no time to lose. You can go in, Mr. Holmes. She's there. We didn't touch a thing. Hmm. I have nothing to ask. It was very good of PC Chandler to let us pass. He said no one has touched the corpse. It's the perfect opportunity for us to put our skills to the test. Watson, let's not waste it. envelope. It smells of rubbing alcohol. It contains three pills. I will take one. Two should suffice for the police. A piece of coarse muslin. Two combs, curiously arranged. So, Doctor, shall we examine our victim? Ah, oh, I'm tired, Holmes. I'm not sure if I am in a state to do this work. Come, Watson, there is little time. Show me what you're made of. Oh, my God. Pray, Watson, pull yourself together. Can you establish the time of the crime? The extremities of the corpse are cold and rigor mortis is beginning to set in. I would say that the murder was committed over two hours ago. 
before 4.30 a.m. Now let's look at the stomach, or at least what remains of it. It's dreadful, Holmes. Who could do that to someone? That's what you're here for, Watson. Tell me what this man has done. The stomach has been entirely opened and... Oh, my God! A number of organs have been removed. So you're telling me that the organs were removed, Watson. They weren't ripped out. Not at all, Holmes. On the contrary, this is clearly the work of an expert. I couldn't have done any better myself. And the uterus is missing. A bruise. Look at her neck. What can you tell me? There are two incisions. The victim's face appears to have bruising, wouldn't you say? Under the maxilla and cheek. There is less on the right side. The tongue is swollen. This door must lead to the cellar. The latch has been recently repaired.
This fence separates the courtyard from the neighbors 27 Hanbury Street. The blood is a dozen inches or so from the ground, blood stains on the wall. There are no trails on the ground, there's no sign of a struggle. What are we doing, Holmes? Looky here. It would seem he has a mark on his left hand. The victim must have worn a large ring or several little ones, and someone pulled them off forcefully. This detail will be very valuable, Watson. You can be sure of that. My dear Watson, now that we have found all of our clues, nothing remains but to subject them to our most likely hypotheses in order to deduce the facts. I hear a noise coming from the street, Watson. The authorities are arriving. It's time for us to go. Holmes has been locked away in his room for days, always saying the same things. I'm thinking, Watson. Very good, Watson. As you wish, Watson. But I am thinking too. So much so that I can't sleep. Annie Chapman. Good Lord. <laughs> 